Well, hello, everybody. Revelation 13, verse 8, speaks of Messiah as having been slain from the foundation of the world. What does that sentence mean to you? As we enter Passover and the days of unleavened bread, I think it's a good thought to have in your minds. Have you personalized that statement, slain, put to death from the foundation of the world? Have you applied it to yourself? Hello everybody, I'm Philip Shields, host of Light on the Rock. If you use the search bar on our website, we have many blogs and sermons on Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread. Just type in those individual words, Passover, or Unleavened Bread, or See the Blood, or Crucifixion, or words like that, and you'll see the sermons and blogs that are up there. Before we get started too far, though, I want to just ask a quick blessing. Father in heaven, almighty God, who loved the world so much, the people of the world, you don't love this cosmos, the society, or Satan's world, but you love the people. God so loved the world that you gave your only son, your eternal companion, your best friend, that whoever would believe on him would be saved and have the opportunity to have everlasting life. Father, we thank you for that. Yeshua, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for offering your own life, for offering to give it all up that you have the glory in heaven to come and be a servant here on earth. We love you, dear Master. And we love you, Father. Bless this sermon, and as we come into the Passover and season and all that, or whenever people hear this, <clears throat> may your love just ooze out of you into them, the Holy Spirit. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. In Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 6, Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 6, Surely he has borne our griefs, He's carried our sorrows, and yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God. Smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's talk about that today. That was Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 6. Passover to us Christians is about the slaying of God's Son for us. And I have a song Unfortunately, they call it the Easter version of Cohen's Hallelujah. Forget the word Easter. We know it's about Passover. The word Easter doesn't even come in the song at all. I hope that doesn't offend you. But this song is really, really touching. I'll put it in my notes. So disregard now. Um, I have two versions that are possible. One is just the two sisters singing the words to each other beautifully. And the other one is quite graphic. It's about what he went through in his crucifixion for us. So I wouldn't let children watch the graphic one necessarily. And older youths might be able to, but I wouldn't let children watch it. Or some women may have a hard time watching it, but it's what happened. And John says in John 19, verses 34 to 37, then this happened and then that happened, and we saw it. We were there. We can confirm this all happened. It happened. Passover to the Jews is an exciting time to recite and recount the story of the Exodus. It's wonderful. Coming out of Egypt, being free, freed from slavery, death of the Egyptian firstborn, and safety for theirs. Because God saw the blood, and when he saw the blood, he would pass over those homes. He would pass over. That's where we get the Passover word. But I think the Jews, unfortunately, God bless them that he'll call them to see this. More and more are beginning to. 
Many of them missed the point of all of that. All those little lambs being, all those blameless lambs being slaughtered, and then their blood splashed on the lintel, the area above the door and to the sides of the door, pointing to the Messiah who was, who was that lamb, who was crucified with his arms stretched out like on the doorpost, and his head up there by where the lintel would be, all bloodied. They miss their Messiah, their anointed one that they look forward to, who has come and is coming again. And all those little lambs pictured him. Why did the Messiah have to be slain and killed? Because the wages of sin is death. Our death, Romans 6.23. And we've all sinned. It doesn't matter if you never killed or raped anyone or something really super evil. Your other sins still required your death. There's no getting around that. God is a loving God, but he's also a very just God. And when he says the wages of any one sin, let alone all the many we've done, is death, then that's what it is. Unless someone is willing to die for you, you know that's where Jesus comes in. But now let's personalize it. If you see yourself, or do you see yourself really, can you see yourself really as having done anything worthy of causing the cruel, painful, tortured death of someone because of what you did, because of what you've been? Really think and honestly ponder that. If because of our sins we could actually see and watch a young, strong, healthy man in his early 30s coming up and saying, I will go through for you what you would have had to go through. Because if we don't have someone who would die for us, we are going to burn up in the lake of fire. That is our death that's being saved us. So how would you like to have to, and would you be able to, see and watch a young man in his early 30s being savagely beaten, scourged, until you could see his flesh torn off and his bones exposed, and then have five-inch spikes hammered into his hands or wrists and ankles, and then left hanging on a cross or stake, hardly able to breathe, pushing up with his legs best he could so he can catch a breath in all that pain, could you honestly admit to yourself, I have caused all that? Could you admit that for yourself? Your sins have caused that. Personalize it. I wonder if we realize what we each have caused. It's easy to recite, he died for our sins without personalizing it or realizing the magnitude of what happened for you, for me. In fact, before I forget, please read the blog we posted from my friend who goes by the pen name of R. Herbert, The Price of Forgiveness. He does an exceptionally good job. And I'll put the link in the notes here. It's also on my website, The Price of Forgiveness. It's a blog, a short article. Now in Scripture we find a teaching that the Lamb of God, who, who we know was Jesus the Anointed One, Anointed One is what Messiah and Christ both mean, was slain way, way back long ago from the foundation of the world. He didn't let, him just, he didn't let himself just die a natural death from old age or whatever. He willingly offered himself to be executed. He had to be slain. He had to be sacrificed as the wages of sin is death. As humans, we all die a natural death, but the wages of sin is death by execution. If we don't accept Jesus, it's death by execution in the lake of fire. That's what Yeshua did for you and for me, saved us from that. And that's why he had to die such a painful death by crucifixion. He had to be executed in the most painful way because sin requires execution. And sin causes a lot of pain. 
So he had to go through it. And he had to die by his blood being shed. Not just from a broken heart, not just the bleeding from the beating he took. I think when it talks about the uh, the soldier took his spear and jabbed him in the side, and it says it pierced, uh, I, I really believe that it would normally be, and the soldier had to pierce, and I'll explain why I say that. The soldier had pierced his side, John 13, 34, John 19, 34, John 19, 34, and all we shall see him, it says, even those who have pierced him, Revelation 1, 7. So those, this piercing wasn't some small thing because there are several verses that referred to this piercing. It wouldn't have been that big of a deal if it was just about piercing a man already dead. Okay, John 19, let's read it, verses 31 to 37. John 19, verses 31 to 37. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, normally we think of Friday as the pre preparation day for the Sabbath, but any day before any Sabbath, including the annual high days, the annual Sabbaths, is the preparation day for that Sabbath. Because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath, that Sabbath, John 19.31, was a high day. A high day is simply an annual holy day. The seven holy days are high days. That high day was the first day of unleavened bread, a commanded day to assemble in worship, a day of rest, except cooking was allowed. That Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Why, why did they ask the legs to be broken? So they couldn't support themselves and push up to try to catch their breath. Uh, the way they crucified people, they made it very hard to breathe. And eventually they would die two or three days later of asphyxiation. They just couldn't do it anymore, couldn't breathe. In the meantime, crows and animals had been picking away at their body as well. Horrible way to die. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him, John 19.33. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. And I think it's because, verse 34, one of the soldiers had pierced, not just right then and there. It, didn't, it wouldn't make sense to do that to a dead body already. One of the soldiers had pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified. So he's making a point here, John is. What I'm saying is true. He died a horrible death. His blood had to be shed, because for sins to be forgiven, blood had to be shed. <clears throat> Life is in the blood. He who has seen this has testified, John 19, 35, and it's true, and he knows what, that he's telling the truth, so you may believe. But these things were done that scripture would be fulfilled and not one of his bones would be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced, quoting from Zechariah 12, 10. So we'll read that next. Zechariah 12.10, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Notice what God says after all of that. God still says the spirit of grace and supplication will be poured out. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. So this is the one Jesus talking. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn, you know, firstborn who has died. Notice in context of being stabbed and pierced, God says even then that he will pour out on the Jews his spirit of grace and supplication, in spite of their role in this dreadful execution, the slaying of an innocent man of the very Son of God. I have a blog I'd like you to read, if you haven't read it yet, Who Really Killed Christ? Yeah, the Jews did. Yeah, the Romans did. Yeah, you and I did by our sins. Those are true. But that's not the whole story. I think you'll be surprised 
if you read that blog, it's posted right now in April 2024, who really killed Christ. Anyway, so the piercing surely could not have been just an afterthought of having already found him dead. No, his blood gushed out at exactly the same time, about 3 p.m., as the blood of the slain animals on the Temple Mount was being washed down into the Valley of Hinnom. Why, if they found him already dead, would they even have to break legs? They didn't. Why would they at that point pierce his side? He had to die from shed blood. So piercing, they make a big deal of it in the Bible. I asked if you had personalized that execution. Who was all that royal, holy, godly blood spilled for? I want you to think about that as you come to Passover during Passover week. For whom was it spilled? Paul teaches us to apply that very personally to ourselves. As we go through Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread, at the end of a very familiar Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's read it another way. Who loved me and gave himself for me. So as we come to Passover and eat of the broken unleavened bread and drink of the Master's cup as we swallow the red wine, remember to keep it personal. Sure, he died for everyone who would accept him, sure. But it was personal. Paul says he did it for me. He's saying that so we learn from that. When did Jesus die? When was he slain? Sure, we know that happened about 2,000 years ago, but really he was as good as crucified, as good as crucified long before that. You know this already, but it's a good thing to ponder as we come through Passover. Revelation 13, 8, talking about the beast power that's coming up. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Worship him. This is the false god, the, the beast power, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Foundation of the world. Let's talk about that in a second. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 to 21, especially verse 20. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 to 21. Knowing you were not redeemed, you were bought back, you were redeemed with corruptible things, not with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, of Messiah, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He was foreordained before the foundation of the world. It was already a, a set plan in place before Adam and Eve were even created. But what's manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Peter calls it the precious blood of Christ. I urge you again to read the blog, The Price of Forgiveness, that a friend of mine, Richard, wrote, The Price of Forgiveness. God's forgiveness is so costly we could never pay it back. And it's used on us over and over, because we all still sin. We'll never run out of his grace and his mercy and forgiveness. And we all fall far short of our goals. But, the, but God's forgiveness never runs out. There's a lot there. Read the block. The price of forgiveness. Now why was he killed from the foundation of the world? I believe that term personally, I believe refers to the time beginning with, in, the con in this context, the word world, cosmos in Greek, can mean a different variety of different things. But I believe it refers to the time beginning with the first sin of Adam and Eve and their expulsion, being kicked out from the very presence of God in the Garden of Delights. Aden means delights. Garden of Aden. Garden of Eden, we say, but it's, it's Aden. 
the lights. That event began the world, the world we're supposed to come out of, the world we're not supposed to be friendly with. The world is the present order of kingdoms that's contrasted with the kingdom of God. <clears throat> we're not to be a friend of the world, and we are not to come and we are to come out of the world. So believe I believe this is referring to Satan's rule over his people. That was the foundation of that world. God knew this would happen, and so in their planning for salvation, the one we know as the Word the one we know as Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, volunteered, lay down his own life, John 10, verse 17 and 18 says. He volunteered to die for all of us. It was his choice. Father didn't make him. It was his choice. God also gave up his companion for eternity, the Word, who had become flesh, John 1, 14. The Word was God, verse 1 of John 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. In verse 14, And the Word, who was God, became flesh. Zechariah 13, 7 calls him my companion, my best friend, my acquaintance. So before his acquaintance for from ever and ever, I mean, so before Adam and Eve were even created, this plan of God to bring children into their family was already started, already in the, in the planning stages at least. It was all set. God Most High, whom we know as the Father, wants children. So we call him Father. None of the angels are able to call God their Father. It says that in Hebrews chapter 2. Jesus is the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Romans 8.29. I'll expound on that when I give an updated sermon on God's amazing plan. I have one called His Breathtaking Destiny. I want to redo it, get it more to the point faster and quicker. And But anyway, it's a three-part sermon right now. <clears throat> God's amazing plan for most humans. But God Most High, God Most High, whom we know as a Father, knew all humans would sin if they were of the seed of Adam. The spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. So all humans would be guilty of sin and its penalty, which was death. Since all humans come from Adam and Eve, when God put them out, kicked them out of the garden, kicked them out of his presence, that meant every human, because we were all inside of them at that point. All who would be their seed were thrown out as well. And only those invited back in could come to God. You had to be called now to come and be among God's people. Adam and Eve were under the death penalty for their sin. And so indeed, so were all their seed, all humans. So every human is born with the curse of Adam, death. Let's read it. Romans 5, verses 12 to 19. Why don't you turn there in your Bibles? Romans 5, verses 12 to 19. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, all men, because all sinned. And death reigned from Adam to Moses, verse 14. Verse 15, but the free gift is not like the offense. There's a free gift. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace of the one man Jesus Christ abounded to many the gift. Okay? And the gift is not like that which came through the one, it's not like the one Adam had. For the judgment which came from the one offense of Adam, okay, resulted in condemnation. We all resulted in being condemned. And, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. Justification means me being made right again with God, being declared righteous, that you're okay, justified. For if by one man's offense, Romans 5, 17, you should know this one. If by one man's offense, that's Adam's 
death reign through the same one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift. The gift is not something you earn. A gift is something you're given. And of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So God is offering us a gift of righteousness. It's not preached very often in some churches. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation because of Adam, even so through one man's righteous act, that's Jesus, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's, Yeshua's, obedience, many will be made righteous. So how are you made righteous? By your obedience? You'll never do it perfectly enough. So it's not that. You won't be perfect enough. By Jesus' righteousness, verse 17, Romans 5, 17, gifted to us. Also, take the time to read Romans 4, the end of it, how God imputed, credited, gave righteousness to Abraham because he had faith. And then Paul goes on to say, but that is not just for him alone, but that's to teach all of us that if we have faith in Jesus, we too can have God's righteousness imputed, credited, given to us. Now let's go back a few verses from Romans 5 that we were reading. Let's start in verse 6 this time. Romans 5, verses 6 to 11. And be sure to read the end of Romans 4 on your own. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone might even dare to die. God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, died for us. Died for you, for me. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So when the Bible speaks of the wrath of God, that's not about you because you're saved from wrath. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. How are we saved by his life? Because he becomes our life. He becomes our righteousness. Not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Now, why was Jesus, have you ever thought about this? If Romans 5 says everyone who's been born since Adam comes under the death penalty automatically, we all come under the curse of Adam. We just read that in Romans 5, the last half of it. Jesus was born as a human. Why was he not born under the death penalty? I'm saying even every baby is already under the death penalty. We used to have a man preach that when a baby is born, it's like a clean slate. There's no sin. Um, no, Romans 5 says every human being is automatically under the death penalty. If you don't believe that, go back and read it again. We just read it earlier. By one man, sin came into the world and all men, it came to all men, it says. So why was Jesus, why was Yeshua not born under the death penalty like every other human was? The answer is because the seed that conceived him was not from any one man, not from any man, not from Adam's line. Sure, he was born of Mary as well, but he was born and so she who bore him would soon see him bear her sins. She had sins. Okay, so the seed that conceived Jesus was not from Adam's line, but the power of the highest came upon Mary. The Holy Spirit conceived him. 
He received the conception, the DNA, the seed of God's Spirit. So he avoided the curse of Adam. He had the DNA of God. In Luke 1.35, the angel says to Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And Matthew 1.20, Joseph was upset when he realized that his affianced betrothed wife, betrothed wife-to-be, uh, was pregnant, and he hadn't done it. So while he, Joseph, thought about these things, what on earth am I going to do? Because she could have been stoned. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So the one who was slain for me and you was very God himself, was Emmanuel, God with us. He was the one who was with God Most High. He was God Most High's close companion and friend. The Word of God personalized the high calling you have and who is working with you. The wages for our labor of sin was our death, our death. He also knew, God also knew, that we would sin over and over and over again, not just once or twice. And we do. Our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. The only one who would be able to remain sinless was one not born of the seed of Adam, but born of the seed or the spirit of God. This is also why Jesus did not come under the Adamic curse that you can read about in Romans 5. There it says, In one man Adam sinned and died, and so all came from that line or under the same curse. But Jesus paid that penalty, and now we are free to be children of God, free to receive the gift of righteousness. In Hebrews 9, verse 24, 28, okay, so you repented, you accepted Yeshua, Jesus, as your Savior, and you pronounce it with your lips and believe in your heart, like Romans 10, verse 9 and 10 says, we must do. Why wouldn't Jesus have to be killed over and over again? Well, it says, for Christ has not entered, Hebrews 9, verses 24 to 28. Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year, you know, on the Day of Atonement, with blood of another, he then would have had to suffer, Christ would have then had to suffer over and over again since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And his one precious life as being very God was worth more than all humans ever, ever put together. Verse 27, Hebrews 9, 27, As it's appointed for men to die once, and after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him. Eagerly wait for him. Don't fear his coming. Eagerly look for it. He will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. So not only did he pay the penalty, once and for all, he's perfected those who are being called by his one sacrifice. It says in another place, don't remember for sure where that is, I think it might be Hebrews 10, 7, I think it might be. But he also gave up his righteousness to us. He gave us his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, a verse you all should really know well. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who knew no sin, so he made him who knew no sin, to be sin for us. He took on all of our sins, yeah, he became sin for us. 
that we might become the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God in him. I call it the big swap, the big exchange. God says, I'll give you all the righteousness that we have, that God has, if you will give me all your sins. I'll take all of your sins and I'll give you our righteousness. Good deal. Because of Jesus Christ, you're also now accepted by the Father in Christ. You are accepted by God. Do you feel like you're not acceptable? Do you feel like you're failing so badly? That's because you keep looking at yourself instead of having faith in Jesus. Your faith must be in Christ. Ephesians 1, verse 5 and 6. I'll cut into the sentence here. Having predestined us to the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Ephesians 1, verse 6 now. to the praise of the glory of his grace by which his grace by which he made us accepted how in the beloved in Christ because God the Father accepted Jesus he accepts you he accepts me if you will just believe that and believe in Jesus and accept that statement you have been and are acceptable to God because he sees Christ in you and you in Christ. You're accepted by God because you are now in Christ. He bought and paid for you and me by his own blood. We are now his. We're now redeemed. We're now part of him, his body, the church. Of course we have to fight sin. Of course we have to pray. Of course we have to draw near to God and Satan will flee from us. Of course, all that is a given. We have to do all that. Acts 10.35 says, of course we have to reject the world's ways and work righteousness and we will be accepted. Of course. But since we can't do it perfectly, our faith is in Jesus. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Too many of you brethren suffer from will I make it syndrome. Will I make it to God's kingdom? You're always down on yourself because you feel like you'll never make it. Well, it's all up to you. I'd be worried too. If it were all up to me, I'd be worried. We have to come believe that our righteousness is by faith in Christ. Like I said, Galatians 2.21, I no longer live. My faith is in Christ. And then he says in Galatians 2.21, which rarely gets read, some churches, I do not set aside the grace of God. I do not set aside the grace of God by which we're forgiven and given righteousness, okay? For if righteousness comes through the law, a lot of you think that if I can just keep the law perfectly, I'll be righteous. Paul says right here in clear English, if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. You didn't need to die if you could do it yourself. So righteousness does not come through obedience. The righteous will, the righteous being having faith in Jesus, will do their best to let him live again in us and he will live righteously in us. But our righteousness is by faith in Jesus. Colossians 1, verses 10 to 14. I just felt all of these scriptures would be really good to review, uh, you know, in the Passover season. Colossians 1, verses 10 to 14. Again, cutting into Paul's long sentences. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Yeah, being fruitful in every good work. Walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. Yes, we should try our best to let Christ rule in us, that this happens. Strengthen with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance 
of the saints in the light. God has qualified us. So all of you suffering from the will I make it syndrome, remember these verses. Colossians 1.12 God the Father has qualified us to be partakers of that inheritance promised to us. He has delivered, past tense, He has delivered us from the power of darkness. That's what Passover is all about. And conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. So just like Israel was delivered from Pharaoh and slavery in Egypt, and darkness, we also have been delivered from this world, from Satan and from sin. So we come into the days of unleavened bread, remember even as we do, remember the unleavened bread we eat for seven days does not picture us putting sin out so much as it pictures us putting Christ in. We have no more leaven to eat, so we're eating Christ. Take this bread broken for you. This is my body. Yeah, that's said at Passover. But the unleavened bread is still his body all during the week. I cannot pick out every fault and sin in my life until I'm finally unleavened spiritually and saved because of all my efforts. No. Once leavened, which we all were, you can't get it out. All we can do now is throw it away. So we throw away the old leaven, picturing our old life, picturing the way we were before Christ, purging the old leaven, throw it out. And then we go get or bake some fresh unleavened bread. Unleavened bread is bread that's never, ever before ever had any leavening. Never. So that can't be us. Because we undoubtedly have been leavened before, and we undoubtedly will still have some leaven or sin that will pop up in our lives during the days of unleavened bread. I'll bet many of you will be more upset if you find a packet of crackers in the bottom of your purse or something, or forgot to take out the, the vacuum cleaner bag or something, than you would be upset to realize that you have done some kind of sin. It's backwards. So the unleavened bread that we eat can't be us. It is sinless Christ. Read my blog. Please study it to better understand or correctly understand unleavened bread. It's one of the blogs I have posted up right now. Read it. Please read it. We become sinless only when Christ becomes our life, which is something he offers and we accept. So rejoice in the Passover in the days of unleavened bread, even as we have a solemn joy as we are remembering the death of our Lord. But we also know he was resurrected. And let's make it very, very personal. So at Passover during the foot washing, yeah, it pictures serving each other and being a servant. But more than that, it also pictures us acknowledging that we see our brother as having been washed by Jesus. So the things that we hear by hearsay and gossip, and so we have these impressions of a brother, or we think we saw sin happen, don't know the whole story necessarily. No, when you go wash feet, you are telling that brother or sister that you're washing, man to man, women to women, okay, that I see you as washed by Jesus. And quit thinking about the things you think you know about them. And then the unleavened bread we're taking in Christ as our life. Humble, clean, pure, flat, no sin, not puffed up. Humble. And then the cup, it focuses on, when Jesus said, drink of my cup. He doesn't say drink the wine. He could have. But he focused on the word cup. Here in 1 Corinthians 11, talk about the cup. Not just the wine. And what would happen when a bride and groom would become married? 
or about to become, when they were going to be engaged, the groom would bring out a cup or a glass and put wine in it, and they would each hold the cup and take turn drinking from it, signifying that whatever is in store for our lives, let's do it. We can do it. We will do it. Together. So the cup pictures whatever God has in store for you in your life. Whatever. So this is why in Gethsemane, we read in Luke 22, verse 20, when he went to Gethsemane just before he was arrested. I'm sorry, let's, let's start here at the Passover first. At the Passover, Luke 22, 20. Likewise, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. He knew he was going to be killed. And we're in the new covenant. So many of you still live as if you think you're in the old covenant. We're not. I need to really update my sermon on the new covenant. and I, Or you can just search new covenant, especially part two. Study that. New covenant. Part two. Print out the notes. See the differences between the first and the old covenant. The old and the new covenant. It's not just a matter that we don't have to sacrifice animals and don't have to have priests and a temple and washings and pots and pans and all that. It's not just that. There's so much more. The new covenant is based on what Jesus does. The new covenant is salvation and eternal life. The old covenant is based on what people do, what we do, the blessings and cursings chapter and all that. But you won't find eternal life being offered in, in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. You won't. Anyway, the cup is a new covenant in my blood. Luke 22, verses 42 to 44. Now he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He asked his three closest ones to stay nearby. He went off a little distance, a stone's throw away. And then he says, Father, if it's your will. Luke 22, verses 42 to 44. Luke 22, verses 42 to 44. Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Take this cup away from me. Is there any way that we can get this done without me having to be scourged and crucified? Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. God answered him. But the answer is, Yeshua, my son, you're going to have to drink that cup. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Wow. The one in Matthew 26 Verses 39 to 43. He went a little further, fell on his face. Have you ever prayed like that? Face on the ground? Say, oh my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Please, father. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. So he went away again a second time. He went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it. Wow, your will be done. Then he came back and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So when you come to Passover, drink of his cup. Wash the brothers and sisters' feet, realizing that even Judas had his feet washed by Jesus. And then drink of his cup and accept whatever God puts you through. Not just accept it, but accept it with thanksgiving. 
I love first I love Philippians four. Verses six and seven are my favorite verses. Don't be anxious for anything. Don't worry about anything. Don't be upset by stuff. Don't lie awake nights wondering. The pain's getting worse and worse. The lump's getting bigger. The cancer isn't going away. If that's what you're going through, or Mary, maybe marital problems, or problems in your family, don't be anxious for anything. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. But in everything, in everything, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known with prayer and supplication, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will come upon you. So as we do the Passover season and the Days of Unleavened Bread, thank God, thank God that Yeshua, the Word of God, offered to come down and be so brutally beaten. Take the wrath of God upon himself for your sake and my sake. Make it personal. Who died for me, as Paul says. Praise him and thank him for it. Don't just show up at Passover. Make sure. Make sure you're praising and thanking God for all he's doing for you. O oh, Father in heaven, come before you, we come before Yeshua, our great Savior. You both are our Savior. We praise you, glorify your name. We love you. Help us love you more, help us show our love more. We praise you and we glorify you, and Jesus, we can't thank you enough. Please come into our lives, into our hearts. Let your thoughts be our thoughts, your ways be our ways. Let us be more and more like you every single day. Thank you for the Passover. Thank you that you have called us to be among the first fruit of those you're calling. It's amazing. You're not calling the great of the world. We're certainly not. You're not calling the smart ones, except very few. You're not calling the nobles and presidents and prime ministers and well-known famous people. You're just calling us that you may be glorified. We thank you for that. Help us value our calling and seek you with all our mind and heart. Thank you for Passover. Thank you for the Days of Unleavened Bread. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, Yeshua's mighty holy name, amen and amen.